Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Zoom. Hi, I see lots of familiar faces here joining us. Good evening. Hi. Well, I think we'll give a couple more seconds just to let people get admitted from the waiting room. And then we'll get started. A few more moments. All right, let's kick things off, shall we? Good evening again. My name is Erica Jenkins, and I'm the manager of annual giving and alumni relations in the School of Education's Office of Development and Alumni Relations. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event in our centennial conversation series titled Returning, to, Returning Home to Alumni Who Have Recently Returned to the School of Education as Faculty Members Discuss What Brought Them Back and Where Their Research Questions Are Taking Them. We're so excited to hear from our two SOE alumni faculty members, Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas and Dr. Rosemary Perez this evening. Dr. Perez and Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for being here. Before we kick things off, I have just a couple of Zoom housekeeping items to share. And if you've joined us for previous Centennial Conversations, this will sound very familiar to you. So just bear with me for a moment. Uh, for the best Zoom experience, please just go ahead and toggle over to speak speaker view, which is located in the upper right-hand side of your screen. We found that this is the best Zoom format for this type of event so that the speakers are front and center rather than seeing a bunch of little Zoom boxes. Um, and secondly, we currently have attendees muted, but once we get into the Q&A and conversation portion of the event, please just make sure you're muted if you're not speaking. Um, you should also have the ability to send a message via chat if you have a question for our panelists. And there's also a raise hand feature that you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen under reactions. So feel free to use that tool as well if you'd like to say something. With that, I will gladly hand the Zoom over to our moderator this evening, SOE alumna and chair of the School of Education Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education, Dr. Lisa Latuka. Thanks, Erica. Um, and please let me add my welcome to our guests. Um, if I'm looking and I see current students, I see alums, I see faculty and staff in the School of Education, that's wonderful. Um, and welcome to Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, um, who is associate professor and who joined us this fall, and Dr. Rosemary Perez, also associate professor, who joined us uh, in fall 2020 at the height of the pandemic. Um, so tonight, to allow more time for our conversation and for your questions, we won't do more introduction than that, but rather I'm going to direct you to the chat for a link to our panelists bios if you hadn't had a chance to read those yet uh, or would like to look at them later. Um, and as Erica said, my role tonight is to moderate the conversation. So I will step into the background and I'd like to get us started as soon as I can by asking both panelists to tell us a little bit about themselves to start. And Dr. Thomas, if I may, I will ask you to start us off and specifically, please tell us a bit about your experiences at the School of Education as a student, your journey since graduating, and the focus of your research. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I believe we have five minutes each. That is what I'm told. So All right, wonderful. I'll see if I can condense 16 years of history in <laughs> five minutes without preparing remarks, which is something I learned to do as a Wolverine, um, just uh, the events of this fall and returning after a year and a half of being online precluded um, remarks. But I, I do enjoy talking. So Lisa, please, please stop me. All right. So a bit about me, um, as you can see in my bio, I was born and raised in Detroit, like many of our Michigan students contemporarily and historically. Um, I attended Bates Academy and Renaissance High School, um, schools that are well known to um, many in this audience. Um, and it feels uh, um, relieving to be home because um, when I was at Penn, people would say, well, where's that? And I would have to explain, well, Detroit actually has magnet schools and examination high schools. And so um, I believe I received an excellent education. I was admitted to the University of Michigan in the fall of 1995, which was a historic class because, of course, um, landmark legislation um, or a landmark Supreme Court decision was based on my class. And I always joke that the complainant could have taken my space because at the time I did not feel prepared 
um, to go to Michigan straight out of high school. So I went to, and also I wanted the black college experience. So um, I watched a different world. So I went to Florida A&M University, came home in 1999, um, mainly because my father passed away. This is all relevant because, you know, many um, Detroiters, especially those of us who get education, we leave Michigan. Many Michiganders leave and never return. But because of that catalyzing incident, I stayed in Michigan throughout my 20s and felt very bound to my um, family of origin. So um, I taught in Detroit schools for six years, got laid off, and then needed to figure out what I was going to do. I was in my late 20s by then. Um, all the while I had been writing the Michigan School of Education. I didn't know if I could get in um, to a doctoral program, but um, fortunately, Ann Ruggles Gear and at the time, Leslie Rex, who are the directors of the program, um, became my mentors. And what followed was, or what commenced was a five-year journey of exploration, of growth. Um, I clashed with Michigan. Um, in every way during that first year. But by the second year, I just had a truly amazing and transformative experience. Two of the things that make Michigan different are as follows. First, we are a, uh, we are a campus that values interdisciplinarity. Already, um, having been here only three or four months, I've been back after 11 years away, I've been back three and a half months and already I've heard from colleagues all over the campus. I've been asked to join university committees. Um, Peggy McCracken has invited me to be part of the Octavia Butler Faculty Advisory Committee. These were experiences that just didn't happen at Penn. Um, we were very much siloed into our units for um, a myriad number of reasons. So I was trained to be an interdisciplinary scholar and it is why I've been able to have the career um, that I have. It's only because of the joint program in English and education and also because Michigan fosters and encourages interdisciplinarity. Also, um, I think the second factor here is that the difference between Michigan and many of our peer private institutions is that there is still a fundamental commitment to public education. I know we don't feel like it here in Ann Arbor, but there were mechanisms within the institution that I reached for as an advisor um, where I just came from. They just didn't exist because the logics underpinning um, you know, a private um, elite institution versus a public um, highly ranked institution are fundamentally different. And so um, my story is only possible with the University of Michigan and it's only possible with the School of Education. Coda, and I'll close. Um, I actually first spent a summer here in 1992 through a program that um, I'm going to mess up this scholar's name. He was a famous black chemist who ran a school, a program for Detroit public school students. But I told him I wanted to be a psychologist and I ended up spending the summer in the School of Education building with Dr. Sylvia Hurtado. And she was my first introduction to higher education, to doing research. I didn't know what I was doing. I was 14 going on 15, but truly this building is special. This school is special and the people in it are incredibly special to me. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thank you. Rosie, beat that. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Um, well, let me first say I'm from the state next door uh, from Ohio, which is not the worst state ever. I don't care what those t-shirts say. I love Ohio. Um, and I, uh, I, my background is in student affairs. So I was, you know, I did my undergraduate was in biological sciences and psychology, and I was a really involved undergrad and that kind of pushed me towards a career in student affairs. I was not ready to do all the things I had planned, uh, which was go to medical school like a good Filipino child should, according to my parents. And I um, really fell in love with student affairs, working with college students. And that career took me all over the country. So I did my master's in Vermont at the University of Vermont. And then I worked at the University of San Francisco and then at American University in Washington, DC. So I literally like crisscrossed the country living in residence halls in some of the best cities. Um, and getting to work with some amazing college students. All the while though, um, I had been coached kind of early in my master's. Uh, one of my advisors would say, you know, you just, 
you're going to be a faculty member. And at the time I was 22, I remember thinking like, I really don't know what you're talking about. But it just kept saying to me, like, you have an intellectual curiosity here that I think you're underselling. And I was like, all right, like, I, I'm going to get a job and like figure out my life. And as I engaged more deeply in my practice and student affairs, there were times where I just felt really, um, I wanted to know more, learn more, and I wasn't quite getting what I wanted in practice. And that pushed me towards a doctorate in, in higher ed and student affairs. And I explored a variety of places. Um, Michigan wasn't necessarily on my radar, to be honest, because it wasn't a student affairs centered place. Um, and I was still encouraged to apply by a number of my friends who were in the program who had come from student affairs. They said, you know, give it a shot. Um, so I did. I very proudly say that I was on the wait list. And I, I think it's really important often for students to hear that like, you don't always kind of get it, land it the first time. And I remember being very um, insecure about that, right? And I still came to visit. And I, I, all I remember thinking is, these are such interesting and smart people that I could learn with, my peers, the faculty. Um, and so when I got the opportunity to come off that wait list, I will say that I was excited. I said, yes. And I came in a little insecure, you know, just kind of worried. Like if I was on the B team, am I smart enough to get my PhD? Uh, but what happened once I got in was that my, you know, intellectual curiosity was nurtured by multiple faculty, you know, I worked with Pat King and Mike Vestito was my advisor, Larry Rowley um, also worked closely with. And folks really never said anything about me being on the wait list. Like that was just about me. Um, and so uh, folks really championed me. I, I think they helped me get to major milestones, not just career wise, but major life milestones were also celebrated. So while I was here, I got married. Um, I had my daughter during my dissertation. She crawled around Lisa's office and like ripped books off the shelves. So my, um, my life trajectory happened in this space. A lot of things happened. And, you know, I was very fortunate to be well mentored and well supported because I knew I wanted to be a faculty member in student affairs. And so some good question asking helped me figure out that I still wanted to do a good amount of research. And that moved me towards uh, landing a faculty position at Iowa State University. And so I was on the faculty there for six years in higher ed and student affairs. Um, while I was there, I was also the director of the Education for Social Justice Graduate Certificate for a year and was on the kind of advisory board for that group, I think most of my time at Iowa State. Um, the re reality is I, I, I longed for home, um, being closer to family. And so that was one of the pulls back to Michigan was geographic proximity, as was, you know, the, what this place has in terms of possibility is kind of unparalleled. You know, Ebony mentioned the interdisciplinarity, but just um, people dream big here um, and really think that we can do things to actually change the world, change situations, change social conditions. And that is really appealing. Um, my research, connected to my research, I focus on college student learning and development and college uh, student success, particularly for low-income students. Um, since I've been back, what's been really wonderful has been the opportunity to, to really engage and work on improving graduate education and making it more equitable, humane, and just. And so that has involved partnerships in the Rackham Graduate School and with folks across the institution. Um, you know, they're teaching a problem-based learning course on um, like humanizing graduate education, which is, you know, I don't know of any other institution teaching a course on how do we improve grad ed. Um, and so it's been a really wonderful way to reconnect and bring, you know, not just my experience, but my research to bear on what happens at the institution. Thank you, Rosie. Ebony, I don't know if you want to circle back and tell us just a bit about your research before I ask the next question. Sure, I knew I was going to run out of time, so um, I'm giving you some. <laughs> I actually was not trained by anyone at Michigan to do what I am known for. So there is no children's and young adult literature track for doctoral students at the University of Michigan. But um, the tools I received as a graduate student here helped me become an autodidact of thinking about texts for young readers. And I um, that is because I studied with two incredible discourse analysts. 
and thought a lot about language and literacy for five years. So my um, primary mentors were um, Leslie Rex, who's now retired. She um, was an interactional ethnographer who came out of the Santa Barbara Classroom Discourse Group, which um, Judith Green is still running out there. Um, and um, we're in conversation with some folks at Ohio State, David Bloom. So really thinking about turning over a context and looking at all of its facets. Um, I didn't realize I couldn't have written my book, The Dark Fantastic, without that um, lens. And then, of course, Mary Schleppergrill um, was my dissertation co-chair, along with Leslie. And so I took every class that she taught between 2005 and 2010 and um, learned systemic functional linguistics. So I took this five-year detour um, that um, ended up being extremely generative for me in the long run. I would not have gotten my job at Wayne State University, which was my first job out of um, graduate school, without it because I ended up teaching language literacy and learning for them. So they positioned me as someone who um, could speak to beyond English education and secondary literacies um, to think about bilingual, bicultural education. So you see the flexibility, the dexterity of, of the program here so that, you know, by joining the Children's Literature Association and just doing a lot of work on my own and networking, I was able to, um, you know, really um, think about a field in ways that um, I would not have had I continued my previous path. My master's degree is from Wayne State in the long 19th century. I was on my way to thinking about race in the Victorian novel for young readers. So I've done a lot of reading of Trollope and um, I really wanted to write about H. Ryder Haggard and how black children were being construed in some of his adventure fiction, but there are no jobs in <laughs> um, Victorian studies. And so I, um, I'm so grateful that I got into JPEE. But um, my work is um, primarily in children's and young adult um, literature, media, and culture. But I do some discourse analysis and um, have some well-cited publications there. Actually, Evan, you just did a great job because Sam Chappelle, one of our um, the spouse of one of our alums, asked, "How did U of M prepare you for your teaching career and for and for life after college?" So I think you've done a great job of, of segueing to your teaching career. So maybe I'll toss over to Rosie and ask Rosie. Can you um, take that same question? How did you um, prepare you for your teaching career? Yes, so I had the unique opportunity to serve as a graduate student instructor for a number of graduate level courses in CSHPE. So I was a GSI, a graduate student instructor with Lisa for Intro to Higher Ed. Um, I GSI'd for Pat King twice in Learning and Development, which is kind of my wheelhouse course that I teach now. <laughs> actually taught earlier today. Um, I help teach our practicum course, which meets with the master students who are engaging in fieldwork and practice to really think about the connections between the coursework and the fieldwork. And then I also taught for a year in the program on intergroup relations, given my background in kind of intergroup dialogue as a practitioner in student affairs. So those, that multitude of teaching experiences with, with both undergraduates and graduate students really taught me a lot about scaffolding learning for students and creating meaningful connections. Like how do you ground the teaching and learning process in students' experiences so that they can connect with the material and engage in critique and rich conversation. Um, I think IGR in particular uh, mm -hmm. gave me good footing in handling like disagreement, dissent, um, tensions in coursework, particularly because I teach a lot of courses that engage in diversity and critical perspectives in which we people won't always agree, but how do we create community and talk with each other, not at each other? So I think I, I honed many of those skills in IGR. I will also say I learned a lot about curricular design and in particular grading and assessment, working with Lisa and Pat. So I think at the graduate level, you know, helping students become better writers, like how do we provide meaningful feedback? And the idea that we can keep working on our craft, um, it doesn't always come out perfect the first time, which I think is just a hard lesson. It was for me as a graduate student to learn, like I worked so hard on this and it can always get a little bit better. Um, I will also say in terms of career preparation, 
you know, the research prep certainly was great. And in particular, I worked on the Wabash National Study of Liberal Arts Education mm -hmm. for, for most of my time uh, at Michigan. And I'm still working on those data. What it taught me was how to work on a large scale longitudinal research project with really big teams where people are coming in and out. And a number of my projects have been longitudinal projects, either in groups or alone and often with multi-institutional partners. So how do you engage in big sustained work over time with partners? I think uh, my experience as a graduate student better prepared me to how, how to you know, manage data, communicate with other people who are working at different places. So and Abigail, I'm gonna go back to you, Ebony, because Rosie started segueing us to one of the, other questions we have, which is from Alicia Flood, who's a staff member in the School of Ed, about why should a prospective student attend the University of Michigan School of Education over in other ones? And I think, Rosie, you started that conversation. <laughs> so, Ebony, would you like to join? Absolutely. Um, so the first um, and uh, most pressing reason, especially for first generation students, um, our commitment to fully funding our doctoral students without um, having them scramble for resources, I think is pretty um, rare these days, given the constraints of budgets um, across higher education. So um, there are not all, there's not only a commitment to fully funding people that we bring in, but also there are institutional resources for their development. So um, we will um, provide graduate student travel funds. I mean, I thought some of this was normal before I became a graduate mentor myself elsewhere. And it is not normal to resource um, graduate students. Some schools, some of our peers do, but certainly not all. So um, again, as a first generation um, union daughter and granddaughter from Detroit, Michigan, um, you have to have the resources in order to complete your degree. And Michigan, if you are a student in good standing, I have found at least in my um, corner of the world here in the School of Ed, we um, try to move heaven and earth to make sure that our students are supported. That's first. Secondly, um, although my mentors didn't always understand the kind of research that I was aiming to do, I always did feel as if all of them, and I include not just my department chair or my dissertation co-chairs, but faculty across the university who I worked with more broadly, um, were all, I'm, I, I really can't think of any ex exceptions, were committed to our intellectual um, growth. You were expected to work hard. So I will, I will say that diligence and being thorough is definitely um, a norm here, or at least was in the 2000s. So um, I worked very, very hard, but as I put in the work and invested in learning how to do good research um, alongside Leslie's um, Discourse and Action Projects um, and Mary's projects in Dearborn um, Public Schools, um, I began to understand how to do classroom research. Um, I also did interviewing for Anne Gear. I also worked some with Carla O'Connor. Um, so I, you know, so again, you know, at many of our peer institutions, our um, at many peer institutions, you don't get to work with a variety of um, mentors um, because mentors are, um, you know, your funding is tied to one specific um, education researcher or education professor. But um, having that broad variety of experiences um, helped me become chameleon-like in some ways. So um, that I, I think sometimes people are surprised that I know how to design a research study beyond um, you know, analyzing um, children's books. But I also believe that um, books that we give to young readers are some of the most important artifacts and some of the most important phenomena you know, that, that we have. And certainly um, a certain part of our um, political spectrum agrees with me because they are doing their very best to ban those books. So, um, but at Michigan, I, I was 
I learned from mentors that it wasn't just enough to know a lot about children's books and to be able to write book lists or to, I'm not dismissing that. That's important work. I do that work. But also to think about, you know, the book as um, a phenomenon that is you know, something that you do things with in classrooms. So, you know, you can construct a study to think about reading and how kids are reading and decoding and comprehending. You can also think about the cultural politics inherent in discourse and interaction around that book by recording what happens during story time and how different kids are positioned within the group and vis-a-vis -vis text. That's a very different thing than thinking about, you know, some of the other ways that um, children's literature and education um, has shown up in the past. And I really do think that the dis interdisciplinary nature of our work here um, and the ease in which we do it um, is um, part of what makes the institution strong. Of course, I have critiques, we all do, but um, I don't know that this is usual. Um, in other, um, or this is the norm in other places. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've mentioned interdisciplinarity a couple of times now, and I, and I remember when I was a student here back in the 1990s, I had the same impression that, that I was just in the midst of a, a, a boiling pot of interesting ideas that was coming from all over the university. It was influence, influencing me quite a bit um, in how I was thinking and what I was thinking about. Um, Rosie, is there, did you have that same experience? I literally, that's at the top of my list. I wrote a list out of reasons to come here. And at the top of it, it said there's room for boundary spanners. So the three of us are boundary spanners. Um, what is very unique about this place is that it is encouraged, like intellectual exploration outside of your home unit is um, encouraged, expected that you are encouraged strongly to integrate ideas and come up with new novel and creative ways to do things. And, you know, the ways, how I was challenged to do that, I think was so loving, you know, it was, um, it was, is this really what you want to do? I remember getting asked once a question, like, is this really what you want to do for your dissertation? Um, and Mike Mosquito asked me such a thoughtful question. And I said, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> He's like, I didn't, I didn't think so either, because I don't think this is actually getting at what you what you're really interested in. And I didn't know until somebody just prompted me with the permission to go big or <laughs> go big or go home. And so I brought to bear my full array of experiences and knowledge across my coursework. Um, and I always thought of myself as a bit of an odd duck, like the student affairs person taking all these classes in the Ross School of Business to learn more about org theory, mm -hmm. but you know, my dissertation and my work since then has been about being a bit of a brick allure, taking parts of things that seem disparate and synthesizing to create new structure, new meaning. Um, and I think that across my career has served me well because sometimes I can, I see something that other people aren't catching up on or catching because they haven't been encouraged to think about relationships between ideas or people or things as possible, as possibilities you know, rather we're often taught about why something shouldn't work. And I think this place has really taught me or pushed me to think about what if, you know, what if, what if you could do this? What if this was possible? What if, and I think sometimes too, as an early, as a scholar to really um, have somebody unleash possibility for you has been just really wonderful. So sometimes I find myself trying to encourage students to do that. Um, particularly because many people are taught they shouldn't do it early, like in prior schooling experiences. That's too wild, but you shouldn't do that. That's too, you know, that is just too wild. Um, whereas here it's been more normative, you know, I would simply add that, you know, the, the supports, you know, for students, I think really are unparalleled. You know, having partnered with the Rackham Graduate School and worked with other graduate colleges, I can say that most folks don't have access to this kind of rich support um, for the array of professional development, not just like ticking off boxes, but really like in a holistic approach to thinking about the graduate education experience, the undergraduate education experience. It's, it doesn't happen like this in other places. And sometimes you don't know until you leave it. 
I wanted to just chime in and um, I know that this is being recorded, but you know, Michigan uh, brought me back with tenure. So I love him, but I won't go back. Um, I was on the university diversity committee there for about five years and I kept mentioning Rackham and someone finally frustratedly told me, Ebony, we do not have a Rackham graduate school here <laughs> at the University of Pennsylvania because I kept wanting there to be some superstructure whenever we were talking about graduate student um, affairs, I would say, or needs. And there was nothing, everything was very much tied to um, a student's individual unit. And it was difficult for students to um, pull together anything, not just research. Now, Africana studies and women's and gender studies were a few areas where that was not the case. But whenever we tried to reach for connection, then um, often we would be stymied because we did not have the Rackham Graduate School. And I, I definitely think that is part of the Michigan difference. Um, so I just had to share that little story. <laughs> they're aware, of, yeah, they're aware of Rackham around the world. So, <laughs> and it's power. And I was going to say, having been at other universities where there is a graduate school, but does not, but where it does not do what Rackham does, I have learned the difference. <laughs> so we we focus quite a bit on your experiences here, but one of the questions that we have from Stephanie Hensel, one of our staff members, is. What's something you can bring from one of your former institutions that you wish U of M had while you were a student? We've got two things. One I think is in development, which is I will say that uh, I came from Iowa State University, which has a very strong student affairs program. And so we work extremely closely with the Division of Student Affairs. Mm -hmm. So those connections between theory and practice were quite tight, particularly for the master students who are engaging in practice in an array of places at the institution. So we've had good relationships with the Division of Student Life at Michigan. I'd love to see those continue to go closer. And I think we're fortunate because um, my former colleagues said, uh, this is unfair because both Dr. Martino Harmon, who is the current vice president for student life, and I both left at the same time and came here. And he said, are you kidding me? So I, I think there's some opportunity for us to cultivate deeper relationships with the division of student life. Um, and to really think about where I'm also pushing them to think about Rackham has some responsibility for graduate students, but not the only responsibility because I think there's a student means Graduate students are students is kind of my thing. Because <laughs> sometimes people don't think of them as students and I think there's an opportunity there. Um, the other thing is I worked again with the Education for Social Justice Graduate Certificate, which was a university-wide certificate. It was housed in the School of Ed. And the thing that I loved about the certificate is that uh, you know faculty could choose to affiliate. It wasn't like if you were in the School of Ed, you were automatically ESJ faculty. But it created really unique opportunities for faculty across departments to really hone relationships and to think about a shared curriculum and shared commitments to education and justice. And what does that look like in how we design certificate offerings? Mm -hmm. So it was really collaborative. Um, you know, we would have events, uh, you know, like ESJ faculty meetings. I would say some of my outside of my office suite my closest colleagues at the institution were the ESJ faculty um, because we spent so much time thinking through, you know, what do we want to teach? How do we want to teach it? How do we want to show up for each other? How do we want to show up for students? And what does that mean for not just the teaching and learning, but our roles as citizens at the institution? You know, what are we advocating for? How are we showing up when there are issues of bias or injustice at the institution. Like those were conversations in my ESJ faculty. And I would love to think about how, you know, me personally, like cultivating community across the school with people who might have some shared commitments, uh, what might that look like? Rosie's inspired me. I think I'll share two um, things that I'd like to see and hope to work on over the next few years um, that um, were sort of baked in at Penn GSE. Again, I cannot speak to the entire university there because we were so siloed. Nothing that I will ever say about Penn is true of Wharton 
for instance. I just have to put it out there. All right, so here are the two things that um, I have noticed over the past three months that I would um, like to bring in. And I think we would be able to very easily implement both. First, because Penn is situated in Philadelphia, um, they are quite unapologetic about their interventionist mode within the city. It has been extremely contentious within the city. And yet individual actors within, um, within the university and from um, outside the university have managed to do lots of bubbling under and also quite public good um, despite headlines um, like one of our researchers back there, you know, keeping some of the moved children's bones. And, you know, we had that sensationalistic headline and there was lots of activism um, around policing in Philadelphia, which is a, which is totally a mess. But um, I would like for us to be more unapologetic about the good work that the University of Michigan is doing in Detroit, in Ypsilanti, in Flint, and in other um, urban, rural, and underserved communities in Michigan. Within this state, Michigan has a reputation for being a university that is focused on national and world affairs. We do it all. We are also a top tier um, institution within the state of Michigan who has been consequential since the founding of the school. And so one of the things that, you know, you were constantly advertising yourself there. I learned how to, you know, sort of <laughs> self-promote. That was like sort of a, um, one thing that President Amy Gutman once told us is that humility is a public virtue, but uh, no, a private humility is a private virtue, but a public vice or something like that. I think it's something that Benjamin Franklin said. And so Penn has a heat map. Penn GSC created a heat map. So you could see all the hundreds of projects that faculty, students, and staff were engaged in around Philadelphia. And I thought, mm, Michigan is constantly doing things. By the way, hi, Karen Downing. She told me the name of the Michigan chemistry professor who created um, a longstanding program for Detroit youth in the 90s, Dr. Um, I, I hope, let me go back up the chat, um, look at the chat, and it was Dr. Billy Joe Evans. And um, so folks in math or science ed or STEM education may have interacted with him, but he would bring up top students from CAS, Renaissance, King, Communication Arts, and try to convince us to become hard science majors. And um, when he failed, he would sometimes rail at us because Robin Gavon, who's a famous fashion photographer, he said, oh, she became, so I am going to, I, I will be delighted to let him know <laughs> what, what influence he, he had on me. But, you know, things like that. Um, you don't hear that when you think about the University of Michigan's role in Detroit. You just hear the sensationalistic, terrible things that you know <laughs> a few actors over time may have in, engaged in. And so I think we could do more to be um, self-promoting. And then finally, um, you learn how to be a very, very, very good public communicator. Um, Penn GSE actually um, sorts and sifts for it because you have two huge bars for tenure. Um, you have your reappointment talk, which is one of the most consequential talks you will ever give in your lifetime. I was told by Many people you know that I had to stick that landing. I didn't sleep for two days before it. You needed to communicate to a pen audience, um, GSE and otherwise, you had to communicate the whole of your research. So you speak for an hour and then you take 30 minutes of questions. And um, because um, tenure and promotion is by faculty vote there, you made sure you stuck you stuck your landings, and so you had your um, you know your reappointment talk halfway through um, the fall of year three, and then you had what Sean Harper famously told us was the save your job talk, which is the. <laughs> which oh, it's horrible. It's the tenure talk. But by the time, and then you have so many different opportunities for this public or quasi-public communication, because re recall I said, they're, you know, we're sort of the opposite. We're siloed. You're constantly communicating to people outside of your unit what your work is like, and you need to do it in terms that they can understand. So it's not that the students there or junior faculty there are better than anyone else. It really is the case that you learn to communicate exactly what you do to anyone from any background. And they specifically 
have different sort of ways that that occurs over time. I'm certainly much more um, able to talk about my work than I was maybe 10 or 11 years ago. So um, I've been thinking a lot about communications and um, how even within my small um, corner of Michigan SOE, we communicate with each other and how to facilitate it. Um, diligence and detail are important. And I think sometimes we gloss that over where I just came from. But I think that, um, you know, really Really celebrating what um, you know Michigan does um, that's good is something that I am hoping to bring to the um, to the community. Well, Rosie told us before that this is a place where we think big and make things happen. So I think you just gave us two or three things that we can all work on. Um, and maybe that's a good way to to segue to another question. And this one, when this one comes from Phyllis Perry, who's an alum. What motivates you day to day? I, I thought about this a lot. This is such a thoughtful question, right? It's such a big one. And um, I think it's the idea that education can be transformational. You know, I know education is also certainly a tool of social reproduction. <laughs> I write a lot about that. I study graduate education, which is all about social reproduction. and. I still believe in the power of education to be transformational, right? Like individuals transform ourselves as we learn new knowledge, we learn about our identities, we think about relationships differently as we learn, right? And we can also use what we are learning and engaging in at the School of Education to transform schools, institutions, and systems to be more equitable and just. So it's not just about taking things in, but we're an applied field of practice. So my students are always kind of, um, I'm always like, well, so what's the so what, right? So if we're gonna rail about this, um, in one of my classes, they say, oh, it's two o'clock. This is where we rail against capitalism. And because almost all, every week at like two, they literally like, let's burn it down. My question is always, what are we gonna put in its place, right? So I'm here for changing things, right? And for us to use all of the creative energies that we have together as a collective to really envision different futures. So I think that that is what motivates me is that like I'm here for envisioning a more humane, just and liberatory future and supporting folks in that process. You know, not just like how I see it, but what do you envision for the future? And how do we work together to move these various ideas forward? Because it doesn't have to be just one thing. I think that um, I completely agree with Rosie here. Um, I do what I do because I deeply believe that children's literature is the best form of time travel because um, those of us who work in early and elementary literacy, and that's not my field of training, but it's something that I worked in for nine years at Penn. Um, we get to introduce everything to kids. It's their parents, it's their caregivers, and it's early and elementary educators. And so therefore, if I introduce a story to a child now in 2021, that child will still be alive in the 22nd century. Just as we're still living with stories from the mid 19th century, from the story of the lost cause to the stories of, um, you know, deficit, um, um, inherent indifference. We're still living with these ancient stories that are transmitted from generation to generation. If you can interrupt the transmission of those stories that divide, that reproduce inequality, and that do not serve humanity going forward. If you can interrupt that, and if you can give students um, new stories, or what Chinoa Achebe said is a balance of stories, then you change the future. It is incredibly powerful. And that is why I have been attacked by the far right multiple times. I'm a children's book expert. Why would they come after me? Because unlike folks who sort of dismiss, you know, like, why is she concentrating on children's and young adult literature and comics and graphic novels? 
it's a battle for the imagination. It's a battle for um, not only the next generation, but the next four or five generations. And so that gets me up every day. I am so passionate about the exact thing that I'm doing, because even if others around me haven't been able to see it over time, for the past 20 years, I have really been laser focused on what Shaobo Shia says. He's a Canadian um, post-colonial theorist. I read a chapter of his when I was 23 years old, and it was all it was in a book called Voices from the Other, um, children's literature in the post-colonial context. And he said children's literature um, was um, one of the most dangerous sites um, in human history because, you know, children, you know, it was a site of continued coloniality because each ge successive generation got those bad ideas passed on. And so um, it's, it's a beautiful quote. I put it in every application up until this past one. Um, and uh, you know that motivates me, that gets me up in the morning. I truly believe if we can decolonize the imagination to quote my friend Zeta Elliott, that we can build that shared future that Rosie so beautifully mentions that, that drives me. There's a, the, the, I'm, Allison Turner, Turner, who's an alum, may have sort of mind melded with you because she asked, what do you think of the impact of the young adult books that feature diverse characters, like the new remix of the classics? What does that impact? Well, really quickly, so I can share the spotlight um, here, because Rosie, I would love to know what you think of this as well, because one of the things that I love in education, our vertical conversation, something else we used to do in the state of Michigan, um, where we would talk from K-12 and then among English education. Um, so I would love to know what you think about this, but here's my answer. Um, when Barack Obama was elected, and of course today we just, you know, shrug about it because, you know, that didn't change um, anything, but it was still extraordinary that in a country um, such as this, he was able to get elected at all. I remember telling my children's literature colleagues on the Rutgers Child Lit Listserv that I believe it was Sesame Street that allowed um, that to happen. And again, that was in that 2008, 2009 moment where we're wiser, more cynical, and you know, um, since you know, than we were then. But you know, so Sesame Street is one of the most, um, and it's children's media, not children's literature, but it's. I think one of the most important programs of the 20th century, um, the 20th century when we look long term, and it was developed by a black psychologist for urban kids um, <laughs> to learn literacy. And you see that we're still talking about Seth Sesame Street. It's still paying dividends over 50 years later. And so um, nothing is more powerful than a story. Um, Chimamanda Adichie, um, acknowledging some of her problematic comments that she's made. I just wish authors would just be quiet and write. I shouldn't say that. I love to talk and I love to write. But you know, she's she said some things and I I disagree and condemn everything she said that's anti, um, um, you know, but she did talk about in the danger of a single story that when you're a child, you're, you know, vulnerable in the face of story. Um, so my current work is really thinking about how do people first learn about enslavement? Um, and I've been writing about this since my Spencer postdoc that kids learn about this, not in social studies, but they learn about it over with us in early ELA. Um, they get a picture book during Black History Month, and that may be their first encounter with enslavement in the United States. And one of the questions I keep asking of my history colleagues is, and social studies educators is, does that first impression or that first encounter ever get overridden? Because a lot of that literature is not meant to transmit history. It's meant to celebrate. Um, it's meant to inculcate citizenship in kids. So that's why it's so important. And that is why the far right, you know, I knew when Nicole Hannah Jones, um, I had an opportunity to talk with her for NCTE. We recorded a session about her new 1619 project book that was released today. Um, I talked to her about Born on the Water, which is her picture book. And um, I think that she could have done anything with her MacArthur Genius Grant, but she um, struck at the heart of, you know, this nation and really um, invited us to consider what lies at the foundation here. And again, this is all thinking about education and the stories 
that we are transmitting to the young, which is why um, we always get um, attacked by the far right. And I just wish people on our <laughs> side would realize that, um, no, I'm not just, you know, reading, you know, cat in the hat to kids and, you know, doing this frivolous work or, you know, this is really at the heart of how kids, you know, will remember or how kids will see the self. And importantly, I believe it's how kids begin to see the other. And it's something that we need to, to think about. But Rosie, um, what are some of the effects that you've seen in higher education? I'm sorry, Lisa, I just wanna know from a higher ed, like, do you see it having any resonance, um, you know, thinking about books that kids are reading as, um, you know, before they get to higher education? What effect does that have? Well, first, I, I just want to say that like diverse, like young adult lit is truly some of the best stuff out there. So adult readers, if you are reading overly complicated novels, some of the best storytelling is in young adult lit. And thank you. Shout out to my colleague, Noreen Nassim Rodriguez, who, you know, really encouraged a bunch of us to start reading more YA lit. It's fantastic, right? Um, the storytelling is really heartfelt you are seeing the students, like I'm thinking these are students I work with right now, you know, negotiating life. Um, my daughter is nine and a voracious reader and she is reading young adult lit. And what I see in my nine-year-old is she is asking big questions of the world, right? So she read a book that recently made a list that of the band, Rick. It's about a queer child who is in junior high negotiating queerness and trying to find community. and you know, she has these questions about, well, why, why would, why would people do this? Like, why would your friends tell you you shouldn't be this way? Why would a parent not feel this way, right? And she's asking these big questions that she knows are real life questions. And she's already thinking about, well, what will I do if one of my friends isn't treated or loved the way they deserve to be loved because they are queer or trans? Right, and so she's had some of that exposure through other students and scholars that she's met, but she's also seeing it through the lens of people closer to her age through reading. And so that grounds it in reality. Whereas when she's talking to you know my queer colleagues, it feels distance because they're adults. They're, they're people who study this rather than living their queerness um, out. And so I, I, I see it happening with my young reader. Um, Truthfully, all of what all she wants to read are stories about folks who, what I would call, are often framed as being on the margins, because sometimes those stories aren't the ones that are assigned. Like those are the ones she wants to read. Um, and so what I'm you're talking that. about, right? There, yeah, what you're talking about, right there. Just like in research, we talk about reflexivity, right? So we're reflect. I think one of the reasons why uh, stories are so powerful, whether they're books or films or comics or television, um, especially at those formative ages, is because you know we say, oh, they teach empathy. But more than that, if you think about research reflexivity, you're teaching a young reader to be reflexive when they're reading what Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop calls the mirrors, windows, and doors of children's literature. So it's not just that kids need mirror books or visions of the self as you know we're often attacked as you know saying um but windows and doors into other people's experiences i always tell my st uh, students that books travel where we do not and often that book will show up or that story will show up um you know now we have all these different modes and genres where we don't have access so that people have met our representatives before they actually meet us and therefore who controls the story, controls society, controls humanity. And that is why I've chosen it as my battleground for my career. Rosie, that made me think about your work in higher ed because I'm thinking about what Ebony is saying about who controls the story. And a lot of your work is about who controls the story. So I think a couple different layers of story. Uh, you know, I do work on student development. So what we've normalized, how do we define developed? You know, who, who decides and what frameworks have we used, who we studied? 
So I think a lot of my teaching has been about expanding the conversation around development and how we might incorporate critical and post-structural frameworks to really understand human development. So I think I'm doing some, at least teaching and learning there, my research less so is kind of in that area, but really my work in graduate education is rife with like who, who controls the story, who controls, who moves forward, what is considered good scholarship, um, how are you supposed to act as a, what is professionalism has been a lot of my work as of late, like these constructions of, of normalcy that are laden in power that we take for granted because we talk about them so regularly as though we're all talking about the same thing and that we should all know. But the, the um, lack of open conversation about how did we come to that understanding really constrains how we engage and, and, and you know, folks are framed in particular with some of my work related to professionalism, you know, um, to standards by which, you know, professionalism is meant to control behavior. <laughs> like that is literally what it's designed to do, create standards, but it's also meant to constrain. And it constrains people differently based on the identities they hold. So some of my research and teaching has been about unpacking that, like, where did we learn this? You know, what are the costs and benefits if you conform? You know, there is cost to not conforming to dominant standards. What are we willing to give up? What is non-negotiable, right? Like, what would I not be willing to do? And so I think that some of my work has been in a different way, a lot about question asking, like, where did, where did this come from? Who is normal? What do we center? If we were to reimagine it differently, what would we do? What would we do in the workplace if we think this needs to be a different definition? If I'm, if I think professionalism is hot garbage, which is I hear what I hear for a lot from students, this is all trash. All right, well, how are we going to talk about it? Like, what are we going to do? We can't just say I don't like it because we're still, we're still part of the system, right? So, what are we going to do? And I think that that kind of pushing on um, things aren't as simple as either or; they're often both and. And sitting with that tension as we try to move things forward is hard and uncomfortable, right? But I think a lot of my work is about uncovering what's hard and somewhat uncomfortable and creating space for us to sit with discomfort and work together to cr create, make something new, mush it around. I don't know, I'm thinking of Play-Doh because my daughter had some slime the other day. So just, I'm thinking about reforming things if I'm not sure, because we don't always have the luxury of completely creating a blank slate. Um, sometimes it is about shift, shape shifting as we reimagine and rebuild. I, I'm sort of stunned at how well you allow me to ask questions that other people have asked without knowing where the conversation is going. So I'm thinking about shape shifting and transformation, and I'm going to ask this last question from that came in early and then we can open this up for questions. But uh, Felix Alvarado, who's an alum asks, how's technology, and I think, especially during the pandemic, during the, this time in higher education and in schools, how is it changing how we deliver education? In every way possible, <laughs> right? So I, I think it is pushing us, not just to think about, technology as, a, as um, you know, I think we really have to think about how to, how to integrate it into learning, to really use it as part of the teaching and learning process, rather than sometimes um, people will talk about technology as simply the modality of delivery, that we don't engage in, we don't learn through engaging with the technology. I think there's opportunities there for us to think really creatively, at least for me as somebody in higher education, like how does our engagement with technology shift how we think about development, how we think about environment. People interact and we develop through interactions with our environment. We're reconstructing understanding of environment because we've always thought of it as face-to-face -face in place. This is changing the game. Um, sometimes it's synchronous, sometimes it's asynchronous. I think pedagogically, at least I'll speak for myself, it pushes me not to just be more creative, but you have to be differently prepared. <laughs> you know, you know, I've got like every chat thing prepared, everything's ready to pay, cut and paste, and if we're moving to high flex, come in person, 
you know, you have to prepare differently. And I think many people have been thoughtful instructors. I think there's an uh, almost like a next level of preparation that is required to be a good teacher with technology. Because I think it, I, I will say in higher ed, right? People were really resistant in the early onsets of online learning that it was, um, you know, not as rigorous. I think it can be just as thoughtful, but it really is about how we think and engage in advance. That's really on the instructor to really think thoughtfully about design. Um, so I think it's pushing us our creative limits, really. As an interactional ethnographer, I would ask, how are people already lear learning online? And a lot of online education is happening despite those of us in PK through 20. Um, people are, um, you know, I heard a remark this fall that on face-to-face -face instruction is, you know, um, the best mode of instruction. And I, I was quiet. Um, I do think that increasingly um, that's going to be an untenable stance moving forward. Not saying that we're going to be in Zoom calls forever, but I think it's a pretty ahistorical stance. And I think it doesn't reflect the fact that, you know, although we are the arbiters of institutionalized learning, people have been learning together in community on the social web since at least the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and it is not reflective of people's actual experiences um, in online environments. One reason why I was able to cosplay as a children's literature expert was because I joined the Child Lit Listserv almost 20 years ago. And that listserv was um, a compendium of everybody in children's literature from famous authors, uh, Jane Yolen, Philip Pullman, um, I, I could just go on and on to every single professor of children's literature um, in not only this country, but around the world. That was all digital. So I was on, I've been talking to people online since the 90s. We did a whole conference plan in 2003, just using Yahoo groups. So some of what we are saying in education about technology is nonsense, it really is. What we did a year and a half ago was not effective online education. We were in a, an emergency situation. And I, I, I'm hearing so much about how unpleasant Zoom was. We were in the midst of a pandemic and we were all forced online without any warning, any plan or any training. We will ignore technologies to our peril. We will ignore the digital and speculative terms to our peril in education. The world is changing under our feet and there are already forces and folks marshalling to snatch education out of the hands of those of us who see it as a fundamental public good. Sounds like hyperbole? look around. I think that we need to think about the fact that technology is here to stay, not just Zoom, not just platforms like these. People are learning and connecting and making meaning online and have been for decades. And that's my opportunity to thank you, Rosie and Ebony, uh, for sharing your experiences and your interests and your ideas and your time with us this evening. Uh, it's really been my pleasure to come along. Um, and of course, many thanks to the many guests who joined us tonight. Um, I think this has been a lovely way to spend an evening. And I just want to say good night to everyone. Take good care. And of course, go blue. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>